Well, someone who has joined us on the line is the Fremantle CEO, Simon Garlick. A big decision by the club yesterday to not offer uh, Trent Cooper, their AFLW coach, a, a fresh contract. Simon, good morning and welcome to the show. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me on. Is this show number one or is it... Uh... No, mate, you're not running through the banner with me. You're on. You're on show number two okay. today. So, uh, um, but certainly, with, it's still very fresh and uh, very exciting for us all. So, uh, uh, thanks for joining okay. us. Um, Glad to be on. Not a problem. You you said on the um, the club app that it was a big call and a and a tough call, and sometimes these decisions have to be made. Can you talk us through the decision and the reasons for it? Yeah, it's right, uh, Mark. Yesterday, I, I, I did say that. Um, Look, it's been a really long and challenging period for you know every AFLW squad across the competition, I suppose. Um, given the, the two seasons pushed into the one calendar year, a um, you know, significant amount of travel, um, fatigue around the COVID impact it's had. You know, we talk about an AFLW sense, but you could argue it's even more pronounced from an AF, sorry an AFL sense. But you could argue it's even more pronounced from an AFLW point of view, given the impact on people who aren't full time athletes and and our players who have jobs and university to go to and the like. Um, so we acknowledged that when we sat down with Trent um, as part of our review into season seven, um, considering a whole myriad of factors as we obviously need to do when you're working through a thorough process like that, it became apparent to us um, as difficult a decision it is to make in these sort of circumstances that we needed a reset and a bit of a refresh in our approach from a senior coaching perspective. Um, so, as you said at the top, Mark, a, a really difficult decision made even harder when it's um, when it's impacting good football people. So, our understanding is there was a player survey done as part of your review of the season. Did that play any role in this? And if so, how much? Oh, look, we... Um, undertook a, a whole range of elements in terms of getting as much information as we possibly could. And, and in reality, you're reviewing your performance uh, from not only an on-field perspective and a week-to-week basis, but you know constantly throughout the year and the pre-season and really gathering information and data the whole way through. So you know, this wasn't you know a, a decision that emanated straight out of one survey or the like. Um, we took feedback across the entire W program, not just the players. Um, so you know, we work through all that information uh, in the appropriate manner, and then make the best possible judgment calls we can. So um, it was it was information gathered uh, over an extended period and from you know a variety of sources that helped us arrive at this decision. I suppose sometimes with a coach, even if he's a well performed coach, and and Trent has had a well performed team for um, well all but one of his his five seasons in charge. Um, Sometimes you get a sense that they've done as much as they can with the group. Was there a was that at all a factor in in this decision? Oh, look, I think Trent's uh, made a really significant and important impact on not just our W program but our club overall. Um, and as you mentioned there, Mark, he's, he's been able to take the team to multiple final series during his tenure with us. Um, and I, I mentioned last night that you know, this decision isn't so much about the performance of the past and not just about the, the the season seven just gone, but about assessing what we think we need going into the future. Um, You know, it's really important that we and our our players and fans and members, as you can imagine, expect us to do everything we possibly can to position ourselves to contend in in both of our programs. And that's essentially the genesis of this decision. That We think it's it's time for a reset and a refresh in, in relation to the senior coach and that'll give us the best opportunity to to succeed. How do you assess your AFLW squad, Simon? What do you think its capability is at the moment? And I guess it's a little bit hard to tell off the back of the second season because of the injuries that you suffered. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, You mean season seven? Uh, So the the one that we're seeing the final series underway at the moment, yeah. Yeah, so season seven, you're right. Um, It's interesting. We, We were really significantly impacted by injury, as you said. Um, the upside to that is the opportunity that it does provide. And when you look at it, what we've actually been forced to do a little bit, but um, really pleasing aspect of probably the last two years, we've seen players of the like of Emma O'Driscoll, Sarah Varia, um, you know, Dana East we brought over for season six. You know, Anya Ty is essentially a bit of a new recruit given the injury challenges she has, but just starting to find her feet. 
Amy Franklin, Michaela Morrison, Jess Lowe, they've all been able to, you know, Maddie Scammon got some footy into her this year and we, we have high hopes for Maddie and her capability um, before it was curtailed by injury. But we think we've got a, a core of significantly talented young players. Now, clearly we've had some of the absolute elite players in the competition in the likes of Ebony Antonio and Kiara Bowers and our skipper and Hayley Miller, um, who we think all three of them have got some good footy in front of them. Um, so we think we've got the genesis of a really a talented group. I didn't even mention Mim Strom, who's coming up on 40 games of AFLW footy, and she just turned 21 yesterday. So we think there's a genesis there. Um, you know, we'll look to continue to add to that. Uh, we think there's some real upside for us. And as I said at the top, there's real, real responsibility of us is giving ourselves the best opportunity and giving our W program the best opportunity to contend on a regular basis. Yeah, I think you found one too this season. Uh, Megan Kaufman was a bit of a revelation midfield and forward for you, for you wasn't she? Absolutely. A real competitor. Um, so we might have to keep, you know, she's got a significant tennis background, as does Janelle Cuthbertson, so we might have to keep scouring the uh, the tennis courts of Western Australia and beyond um, because both of them have, have been, Megan obviously in this last season just gone, but uh, JC, who's uh, had a wretched run with injury, but is obviously an All-Australian centre-half back as well too, um, who's, who's provided a significant leadership and she'll be ready to go, to go for season eight as a bit of a fresh recruit as well. Can we just touch on some matters more general club um, while we've got you? Um, the off-season at Fremantle, has it unfolded well for you? Oh, look, we feel like, you know, obviously the off-season being the trade period in particular and the draft upcoming, you know, it's much talked about, Mark, but we were pretty active from a trading perspective. Um, uh, really pleased to be able to bring in Luke Jackson, who's someone we'd identified you know, really in his draft year uh, and had high hopes to be able to try and tempt him back at some stage. Um, really pleased to bring him into our program. Um, to be able to also have Jago Ramirez, someone of his ilk, who's 28 years of age, been able to play some consistent footy over the last couple of years after being hampered by injury early in his career. Um, but I think we all understand the capability he's got on field, but also um, from an off-field leadership perspective, he's just going to be outstanding. And to support some of our emerging young mids is, is really important to us. And and we still head into this year's draft you know, with, with four picks, starting at pick 30, but also have a decent stock of future picks, um, which might give us some opportunities to be flexible and get back in earlier in, in drafts in, in future years. Um, you know, we've we've been unapologetic about trying to create an environment um, of, of of one that gives our guys great opportunity to succeed. Um, the character of those two um, men, young men that I talked about coming in is without question, and they're going to really help us to that end. So we're pretty excited. You know, we've got a hell of a lot of work to do. We, we haven't achieved anything in terms of what we're, our aspirations are as yet, but we um, we still think we're well positioned. One thing, could you clarify for me? And I may have missed this. I'm, I'm not too sure, but the the Griffin Logue trade to North Melbourne is for a future second as part of the um, that package that the the AFL was offering to the North compensation Melbourne. Compensation package. Yeah, yep. that's right. Is that yep. based on where North Melbourne finished this year? So what I'm asking is, is you basically inherited pick 19 at next year's draft? That's right, and that that ostensibly is it's the pick after North Melbourne's pick, so they got a compensation pick immediately after their second round pick. Um, so if they were to finish where they did this year, it'd be essentially be pick twenty. Yeah, that's a pretty valuable pick, isn't it? Uh, given how the draft unfolds this year, uh, these these days. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And look, it was it was an interesting situation in the sense that obviously Griff um, made his intentions clear, which we were, we were disappointed about, but that is the, the way um, and, and the decision he made um, uncontracted meant that we lacked a little bit of of leverage in that sense. So we were um, we were pleased to, to be able to um, get what we thought was a reasonable compensation for, you know, a young up-and-coming player who we invested a fair bit in. And I guess the other, the other trades are pretty much understandable, aren't they? Lloyd Meek really has to go somewhere where he can play. I think Darcy Tucker likewise... Blake Akers is probably one who had a really good season, um, but also you probably feel there's a group of young players behind him in the pecking order trying to get into the team. Yeah, it's a really good point, Mark. I think um, Blake was outstanding this year. He would have been on the cusp of all Australian squad selection and um, did a terrific job in that season itself. Blake was obviously with us for three years, so you do look at the totality of performance over that period of time. And, you know, with all of our players, we're, we're trying to set ourselves up to, to be able to bring a premiership squad through um, 
together and we've got to be really responsible with the offers that we make and you know, we were more than enthusiastic for both Blake and, and Griff to stay uh, and we thought we did the right thing and, and provided them with a with a reasonable offer in that sense but understand um, that they sought opportunity elsewhere and, and as you said Lloyd is just an outstanding character um, and we certainly saw opportunities for him to stay um, but understood his desire to get more opportunities elsewhere, which he sought to do, and that really did help us unlock the um, the Omira trade a little bit as well too. So that sort of all happened you know, pretty late in the piece. Just one more before I let you go, Simon. Will Nathan Five captain the team next year? Um, I don't know if Five is back from our Nicaraguan training base, um, Mark. <laughs> but looking forward to looking forward to catching up when I do. Um, <laughs> look, you know, the, the thing about um, you know. Fifey next year is that he's going to have a significant say in, in what he does in that sense. He's been an unbelievable captain for our footy club, an unbelievable player, which is, is a reasonably obvious statement. Um, but we work through a process every year that you know clearly elicits feedback from the playing group and the football department before recommendations come through. Um, I think the thing I'm most excited about um, is the potential for Fifey to come in after having you know first pre-season in a long time without been cut open multiple times and having off-season surgery. Um, so, you know, judging by some social media posts, he's looking in, in, in pretty good spirits and in, in pretty good shape. So we're really looking forward to seeing what he can add to um, the playing group for next year. Sorry. Yes, the Eagles theme song there playing in the background. We have Trevor Nisbet uh, ready to talk to us. Please join in the conversation on the Temper at Bedsheet text line 0487 736 736 or on the open line 13 12 55. Trevor Nisbet, it's not often you get welcomed in on the back of the theme song. Did you run through the banner as well while you were listening? Uh, no, I didn't, uh, Mark, but nice to, nice to talk to you. So in 2022, Trevor... You've been involved in footy a long time. You've seen a lot of success. Is that the toughest season you have encountered in your time in footy? Well, I think it's the most extraordinary season we've encountered, Mark. It's, uh, it was uh, tough from all aspects. It, it started uh, disastrously with uh, with injury to uh, a number of our, our players and then on top of that with COVID. So it was, uh, it was a terrible start and... Uh, you know, it just didn't finish well either because uh, we were competitive in a lot of games but weren't able to get over the line in a number of, uh, of closer games towards the end. So, uh, obviously, that means there's a lot of work to do to ensure we've got a, a fit football squad and hopefully the worst of COVID is behind us but we've, we won't be taking that for granted either. So my understanding, the Eagles do a big planning session. You go up to Broome every year and you, you work out what has happened and, and what you need to do. What did you uncover during that session looking back and also looking forward as to what might be required? Well, I think there's a, there's a number of things. Obviously, we review everything every year, but uh, every second year we do a, a total review of um, what our strategy is uh, going forward. Um, what our timelines are, and, and as a as a board and a collective with our executive, we try to work out uh, where we're at now, um, where we're going to be in two or three years' time, and obviously we're always looking at the future um, and where the club it ha- is positioning itself in a uh, a very very tough competition. So we we went through all of those things over a couple of days and uh, obviously when we get back to implementing some of the strategies that we we want to put in place, uh, a lot of it revolves around uh, the success of our AFL team, our AFLW team and uh, so forth. So we've got got a lot of work to do and and we'll be putting a number of things in place to, to try and get those things right. So there was a lot of COVID and that is very hard to, to manage your map, if you like, um, but also a lot of injuries. What's your assessment of the injury list? Um, how many of them were not preventable and how many of them were preventable, do you think? It was probably 
50-50, I think, Mark, in, in the end, we were um, we were really disappointed with a lot of the soft tissue injuries that we we got throughout the season, and uh, they're always the ones that we think we can prevent. Uh, some of them aren't, prevent, aren't preventable, but certainly the ones that, um, uh, you know, that are collision injuries uh, or, you know, just accidents during games or trial games or whatever, uh, some of those were extraordinary. And, and we had, you know, a number of ankle injuries this year, which it seemed to, you know, seemed to be a spate of those. And that was disappointing. But we're not sure that we could have prevented any of those given the circumstances with all of them. But certainly we we have to get on top of those uh, injuries we can prevent. And that's something we're addressing. And uh, we'll... We'll have a, a change in uh, in personnel in a, a couple of area of those high performance areas that will uh, assist us, and uh, hopefully we'll have a a fit competitive squad all year round, and that's uh, that's the aim. Are you able to say what those changes in personnel will be at this stage, Trevor? Because you've always been a club, I think that's um, moved towards stability as opposed to to radical change, and and viewed that as a strength of yours. So it it would be quite a significant thing if you if you opted for a change, particularly in that area? Yeah, well, our, our strength coach has left us, so our, uh, we're, we're bringing in another conditioning person and we're, we're looking at uh, two or three other areas uh, which um, will affect the, the players and their routines and, w- and what they're doing. So it'll be, uh, it'll be a different look in our high-performance area. Um, uh, under the guidance of Warren Coford. Warren um, has been with us for a number of years and has done an outstanding job. And uh, obviously it's his responsibility to to ensure that our players are on the track and uh, and playing and available. And that's something that he's addressing along with uh, with the rest of us to to ensure that we've got a, a fit and healthy squad. And that, that means uh, some... Uh, changes in personnel, and uh, that we think that'll help us as well. Can you say at this stage who the new strength coach is going to be, Trevor? No, it's a, we we're in the process of appointing him. Uh, that will be hopefully done within the next uh, next week, and uh, if all goes to plan, he'll be in place prior to the players coming back. So uh, that's that's been the aim. We've been working on that for a couple of months. When you have a two-win season, clearly criticism becomes inevitable and it's hard to sort of uh, delineate between the blurred lines of what is justified and what is just there because of where you are on the ladder. Some of your players got questioned over their preparation and their readiness physically to play AFL football. Elliot Yo and Nick Natanui in particular were singled out. Was that justified, do you think, or do you feel that was uh, an unfair criticism that was the result of um, poor results on behalf of the team? Well, I think some of it may be justified, but I don't think it all was. And I think some of the some of the unfairness and the unfair comments are, are ill-informed. And look, it is difficult to stay in tip-top shape if uh, if you can't do the required running and 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 work. And by the time you come back after long layoffs, it is often difficult to be at uh, you know in peak condition. Having said that, uh, some of our guys um, would put their hand up and have and have said, look, I, I could have done better at, at some of the preparation, not just uh, one or two individuals, but a number. And one of the real difficulties now is that we don't have access to the players for uh, three months in the pre-season period. And it is almost impossible to gauge how the guys are going uh, when you don't have access to them over that length of length of time. So we we rely on the players doing the work and obviously they're all given programs and they're all given the right instructions and what they need to do to come back in, in great shape. And uh, hopefully this year, everyone will follow those instructions to the letter so that when they start their training, uh, they will be in, in really good shape. So some clubs are, by going too much towards the one-size-fits-all fitness preparation for their players, and you can also 
err by going a bit the other way. It, it felt from the outside like Adam Simpson was quite prepared to be flexible with some players and to to enable them to be themselves and prepare the way that they needed, they felt they needed to prepare uh, for a season. Have you had to tighten that up a little bit to try and get more consistency in preparation across your player group, do you think? Oh, I think that's probably right. I think Adam's um, review of what he's done in the last uh, last few years, really, uh, he's had a really good look at the program he's implemented, what he's been able to do and what he's been able to control. And I think uh, giving autonomy to players is one thing and Adam's addressed that and then probably had to look at, well, where do I tighten things up so that uh, I have more um, control on what, what each player does. And certainly he's he's been addressing that uh, when you come off the season that we've had everything gets looked at and certainly Adams is critical of, of himself as uh, on where he's at as anyone and uh, he looks at all of the things that uh, that need to be addressed and, and he's he's going through everything with a fine tooth comb so uh, hopefully um, we get our squad on the park quickly we get the most of them back fully fit and uh, then we can we can start a progression up the ladder one thing that does happen when you get criticism like you've had over the past um, eight or nine months or so is that it pokes the players a little bit. Do you sense a resolve and maybe a little bit more determination about them in the way they're going about this season? I'm hearing that a, a lot of players are back at the club early doing some uh, some early preparation. Yes. Look, I don't, I don't think there's any doubt that um, when you're publicly criticised on a continuous basis, uh you do take stock and, and you have a look at all of the things that you're doing. And the players are no different to anyone who, who cops constant criticism. And with the barrage of criticism that we've uh, we've copped this year as a club and as a player group, there's no doubt that the players are looking to rebound and uh, do, you know, our fans and our supporters uh, justice by, by playing some, some really good football. And hopefully they... They stay true to that, and uh, we'll only know that when they when they commence training again, and that's uh, that's only in a couple of weeks with the first of four years coming back and the seeing you guys back in December. A big question for you, and and a question that the punters are clearly interested in, judging by the text messages coming through on the text line. The captaincy, Luke Shuey, been a great player, absolute superstar in that 2018 Grand Final, but has had his battles with soft tissue problems over the last couple of years, appeared to be maybe getting on top of it towards the back end of last year. Do you go another season with Luke as the captain or do you need to look at your on-field leadership, do you think? Well, we're we're always looking at that every year and the players have a say in that as well. Um, I'm sure, you know, people... um, probably wouldn't realise Luke played 17 games uh, this season. And I think he's got on top of uh, the way he's managing his, uh, his hamstring problems. So uh, from that point of view, we're, we're very happy with what he's been able to do. The next step for Luke is, uh, does he, one, want to stay on as captain? And we'll discuss that with him. And the second part of that is, um, will the players um, you know, support him in, in that captaincy role? And I'm sure they will. And the next part of that, of course, is a recommendation from the from the uh, um, football department as to who should lead the club. Uh, look, and it is a difficult time. It would certainly be a difficult time for a uh, a younger player to come in and, and take over the role at, at the present stage with uh, with where we sit at the moment. But having said that, you know we'll work through that over the over the coming months and. And uh, make a decision. And either way, I'm sure everyone will be uh, very supportive of, of who we put in place. And Luke has been a wonderful captain for us. He's done a really good job in, in pretty trying circumstances. And he's such a selfless uh, person. We're, we're, we've always been very confident he's the right leader. Um, and he may still be the right leader going forward for at least another, another 12 months. 
Do you have leaders waiting in the wings, Trevor? I know Jeremy McGovern is one that springs to mind, but has had his own injury concerns and is uh, the other side of 30. Do you look at people like Tom Barris and Liam Duggan as potential alternatives? Well, certainly, yeah, they're, they're good young men. They're, they're certainly potential. We, we look at um, people like Dom Sheed, Oscar Allen, and unfortunately, they didn't play uh, last year. And there, we have a number of, of strong leaders with strong views um, within the club. So, look, there is um, there are, there are alternatives, but uh, we've got to be sure, and you've got to get that right. And uh, Sometimes you can have too many people in your leadership group. Sometimes you have too few. So we, we are looking at making sure we've got the right leaders in the right spots because it's a, it's a critical year for us, as everyone knows, in a, in a really strong rebuild. You had restricted crowds in a couple of your early home games and obviously you had the season you had. What's the financial impact of that likely to be? I know you're a very strong club financially, but will you take a hit? Uh, well, Mark, it's been it's been really tough, uh, in the, particularly in 2020. But we've we've with our support and with the people who've been supporting us, pledged um, money to the football club and so forth. We we're going to get out of the the tricky situation reasonably well, and we're really thrilled to be able to get through uh, the last couple of seasons, in particular even with 50% crowds and in, in some cases, no game, um, no crowds at games. So we've been able to get through reasonably well. So overall, um, we're pretty pleased with our financial position and and we are in a, a, a strong position off field. So, um, but that comes with uh, the support we have from our members and, and our, our corporate partners and so forth. So we're, we're very lucky in that sense as a football club and we, we're going pretty well. Four picks inside 30 in the draft coming up at the end of the month. This is a big draft, I think, um, Trevor, and uh, for you guys. And your DNA says you build through the draft. Do you target specific traits? We would say from the outside you need some speed or is it the old story, best available player? Well, I think it's the, the best available player, particularly it's the first time we've had... Um, a couple of first round picks and I think it's you know the four inside 30 I think we've had nine inside 30 in the last 10 years so it's uh, it is a big draft for us we, we're really keen to bring in some more talent uh, we started that last year um, with some young talent and and uh, they were able to play some games with um, Brady Hoff and Rhett Bazo playing a number of games last year so this year again, we'll be adding four, hopefully, really quality young players, and that's uh, that's what we have to do. And when we do that, um, I'm sure um, they will help us, you know, climb the ladder as quickly as possible. Nick Nat Nui getting towards the end. I, I believe you had strong interest in Lloyd Meek, but he um, chose Pawthorn. Do you look at a ruckman with one of those early picks as well? Have you scouted any young ruckman around the place? Yeah, well, we've looked at a, a number of options. Um, we're, we're really keen to keep progressing Bailey Williams and, and Cal Jamison. And if we can get a, another ruck in the draft, we'll look at that. It's got to fall your way. You can't just uh, pick and choose. Everything's got to fall your way. But certainly, it's another option for us. And, uh, yeah, we we had some interest in, in uh, Meek, but uh, he decided to... Uh, head to Melbourne, and uh, that was a bit unfortunate. But, I mean, that we don't know whether we would have got the trade done anyway. So, I guess in the end, uh, we may have to go back to the draft to find uh, another young budding ruckman. Um, so, yeah, we'll, have, we'll certainly have a look at it during this draft period. One more question from me. Clearly, when you go to the draft, the other part of that equation is development, and your waffle team has been an ongoing issue for you. What steps have you taken to make sure that is in a better situation? Have you been able to make any headway with the WRC and the other waffle clubs on getting a better list together? Yes, we've made some headway. Um, it, it's um, heading in the right direction where we're able to uh, a 
at least recruit under better circumstances and we're in the marketplace now to to find some players to um, assist our guys that we already have at the, the Waffle Clubs. But I think, uh, unfortunately, the last couple of years, the, the Waffle performance has been a byproduct of all the problems we've had with our senior team, um, not having enough players available and consequently that cascades down to our waffle team. So when we've only got four or five players available um, from our, our senior list and uh, we've got our, our waffle players, um, it has been difficult at times. But the guys have stuck together pretty well and uh, we'll have uh, a number of those players back with us again uh, next year. But we'll also be adding to that list and uh, fortunately, I think we'll have um, a much stronger um, backup squad to pick from. And therefore, if we can add some senior players to that via our senior list, uh, I think we're going to be very competitive. So that's the aim and hopefully uh, that'll work out as well.